Welcome to the Cloud Accounting Podcast. I'm Blake Oliver. And I'm David Leary. Awesome. Well, I think that worked, but in case the audio wasn't quite clear to our listeners, we are joined today by a very special guest, many guests, in fact. Jennifer Johnson, CPA, a senior lecturer in accounting, has brought along her entire class as our virtual studio audience. So uh, thank you all for joining us and please give yourselves a hand. All right. Well, uh, Jennifer, thanks so much for bringing your class along and, and, and being our audience today. I understand this is accounting information systems. Is that right? Correct. We're really happy that you reached out uh, to us and, and suggested doing something like this. So what was it that prompted you to, uh, you know, like, well, first, how did you learn about the podcast and what gave you this idea? So I've been listening to the podcast for about six months. I um, just kind of stumbled across it. And um, ever since I started listening to it, I thought it would be great to introduce your topics to my class. In our course, we get the chance to talk about accounting technology and how accounting is not just about debits and credits and audits and tax returns. Um, so uh, this semester, I'm assigning them all the opportunity to listen to various podcasts, of which yours is one. And then they get to share the recent news and technology with the course. So everybody's learning something new outside of the textbook. Having this event happen is just a, a technological marvel of the cloud um, because we have two different things, technology we're using to record. Um, we've never done this before with a studio audience like this or, or a, a virtual studio audience. So it's a, a testament to the cloud. Yeah. And for those who are interested in nerding out about the tech, uh, we're using Zencaster to record the podcast audio. That's what we normally do when we record because David is in Tucson and I'm in Los Angeles. And then we are now adding Zoom for the video chat component. So we can record locally to our computers to get high quality audio. And then we can also reach you through Zoom, which by the way, students, if you're not familiar with it, I highly suggest you you get familiar with Zoom because it's what it seems like all of the modern cloud-based accounting firms are using these days. Well, especially if you're going to be a cloud accountant, because you don't want to have to drive to your client's offices and do face-to-face meetings. Yeah, no, avoid that at all costs. <laughs> So we got news to jump into, which is great because Blake brought articles, I brought articles, you, the students have brought articles to discuss this week. We do have a couple of reviews we should probably get through and then we'll jump into the news. Uh, So this is from Johan Potgeiter, CA, parentheses, SA, which I'm not sure what that means. I think it's South Africa. Oh, CA in South Africa. Got it. He says, five stars. I absolutely love this podcast. As the cloud accounting manager and fully remote worker for Outsource CFO, the insight, commentary, research, and witty feedback regarding everything accounting, cloud, tech, zero, AI, and everything in between has become a staple source of knowledge and information in my week. For the past year and a half that I've listened to David and Blake on this podcast, I've not missed a single episode. Wow. Thank you. I cannot recommend this podcast enough to any person that is even remotely interested in the wonderful world of cloud accounting. Even though they are based in the USA, I find that their content also relates to me as a professional in South Africa. They're truly a cloud accounting thought leaders. Smiley face, keep up the great work. Thank you very much. That's a great review. Great podcast, five stars. This one's on iTunes. Uh, Engaging and informative. I've loved listening and staying up to date with the latest accounting industry news. And this is from Horizon underscore view on the United States of America. T. Scott T. said, love your podcast. I can't get into a lot of podcasts, but I listen to yours on a regular basis. Always informative and entertaining. I even made my husband listen to several episodes as we were driving home from ZeroCon this summer. He's not an accountant, but I think even he enjoyed it. Keep up the good work. My wife won't even listen to the podcast. So that's really a testament. Yeah. And it's even better if you can get your spouse or significant other to actually de- subscribe and download the podcast separately. That, that really oh, yeah. help pump, pump our, our numbers. numbers. So uh, one more review hooked exclamation point. Hey guys, I've been listening to your podcast for the last two weeks. I'm addicted for anyone wanting to know how to disrupt their profession and stay ahead of the curve. This is mandatory listening. Keep up the great work. And that's from Aztec, A-S-T-T-I-C. If you want to leave us a review on iTunes or Podchaser, we'll read it on the air. But let's get to the news, shall we, David? Yeah. Should we jump in with one of our stories, one of the uh, student stories? I I think let's start with the students. So we're doing this a bit different this week. We have uh, our studio audience here, and uh, I understand that some of you have brought articles to share. And so we would love to go ahead and do that. Um, Who wants to go first? Uh, I'll go first. 
So go ahead and tell us your name, uh, maybe a little bit about yourself, and then uh, we can get into the the article. Uh, my name is Alex Dolan. I'm a senior student here, or a senior accounting student here at uh, UT Dallas, and um, I'll, I'm, I'm like one semester away from graduating, so all this exciting stuff happening in my last semester. I found an article from consumerreports.org by Alan, Alan St. John and Thomas Germain um, about smart speakers and how they pose potential privacy threats and uh, are uh, viewed as kind of invasive by some people. Um, a little bit of a summary of it is uh, investigative reporting has shown that smart speakers are recording transcripts of voice recordings that are being screened by employees for the improvement of devices, quote, um, and not for marketing purposes. Uh, critic, critics say uh, this policy is unfair to consumers. Perhaps it is uh, spelling a bad habit for big tech for surveillance without the consumer's knowledge. So I just wanted to know what you guys thought about this. I have smart speakers. How about you, Dave? I have an unplugged Alexa. It's usually unplugged. <laughs> oh, you guys scared no, by this? No, I, it's, I've, this I just uh, plug it in when I want to use it and unplug it when I don't. Just been doing that since oh. day one. So this is good. Now that we have kind of a an audience here, we could take a survey. Like, how many of you are using actively use a, a smart speaker? Yeah, raise your hands if you've got one. Okay, so it looks like one, two, three, probably what twenty percent, a third maybe. It's funny. I when this article came out, I kind of got paranoid for a for a moment because I have I have a smart lighting system in my apartment. I bought all those light bulbs. Philips Hue light bulbs that you can control with your voice through Alexa. And it's kind of a pain to set up, but once you do, it's pretty awesome. Oh, and I just woke her up. Uh, let me see. I'm <laughs> <laughs> She's listening to our conversation. Yeah, I got a little bit paranoid about this, but the good news is that now you can go in and you can change your privacy settings, which is, you know, that's what's great about this article that you brought is it, you know, now we have options to control privacy and whether or not these um, recordings are going to be listened to by human beings, right? But I think like the, there's a broader discussion, which is, you know, how much privacy are we going to have in the future? Because everything I read suggests that that privacy might be going away and we may not have a choice about it in that there's all these big data companies now that can take in our credit card purchases and our loyalty card purchases and our location data from different apps and there's all these well, different- We talked about that two weeks ago about how much you tip. That's being tracked now. Yeah. And not to mention there are cameras everywhere now. People have smart doorbells. There are public surveillance cameras. Um, and there are companies that just aggregate this data and can use AI to know an incredible amount about you automatically. And I'm not sure there's a way to really stop this. I mean, there's, there's legislation that's been proposed. I think San Francisco banned the use of facial recognition. Uh, in San Francisco uh, by the police department, but ultimately how much can legislation do? And I think it ties into some of the other articles that you guys are going to share later about social media and presence there. We may just have to get used to a world in which we don't have as much privacy as we used to. The, this article didn't touch on all the apps you use, right? And almost every time you turn around, you install some app and it's asking for access to your microphone, right? And mm -hmm. I and this probably happened to everybody. About three weeks ago, I was complaining my teeth to my wife about my teeth were hurting. And I went to Twitter and I got Sensodyne ads in my Twitter feed. And I know I didn't Google search that. Like, I've never clicked on a Sensodyne, yeah. uh, Sensodyne toothpaste ad. So, like, it's a little on the creepy side at this point. That's creepy. I used to work at a, um, at a pet store. And while I worked there, all the ads on my Facebook were all about pet food and pet uh, pet appliances and stuff like that. So. Oh, because the location tracking. So, yeah. Well, just because I was always saying stuff about pets food because I was a sales associate. So, it always thought I was talking about pets. And that's the thing with big data, right? It's so smart and so stupid. Like, it, it, it thought you were just a <laughs> person that, like, loved dogs or, or pets, right? Not no, It's not smart enough to know, like, oh, he works there. We probably don't, he probably doesn't want to buy any pet stuff. <laughs> And they still advertise it. Or it happens like you buy something on Amazon and then you see ads for that for the next two weeks. You already yeah. made the purchase. So, so you know, what is the tie into accounting here? If I'm going to stretch here, I would say that, you know, we're talking about big data. And if you look at the future of audit, for instance, there's all these applications that are being developed now, such as MindBridge AI, that ingest large amounts of data and then extrapolate risk uh, on these data sets without us having to manually do it. And that's essentially the same logic, the same systems are being applied to our personal data to find things out about us. But we can take that technology 
and we can apply it to accounting, to audit in particular, to, to hopefully save ourselves a lot of trouble. Uh, the, of course, the, the challenge is that we don't always know exactly how it works. So then as an auditor, right, this is one of the reasons that this, this AI and audit has, is taking so long to get into use is that we don't often know how machine learning works because it's an algorithm that we don't understand. It builds itself. And so then how do you, as an audit partner, how do you use that tool if you can't explain it or if you can't look inside it? Interesting questions, right? All right. Well, thank you. Thanks so much for sharing. Uh, is Alex? Right. Can I ask one more question? Oh, yeah, sure. Do you think that um, audit in the future, like in the near future with big data, do you think that a privacy audit will be something that will, will exist? That's a great question. Um, if, if legislation continues to you know, be passed uh, protecting consumer privacy, then a lot of these big companies are going to have to go through audits of their consumer data to make sure that they're not collecting too much or that, you know, I, I don't know, they're, that they're complying, right? I, uh, so, I've yeah. even seen that as being a service you could offer as your accounting firm, right, to your clients. Like, hey, we will, mm-hmm. we will help you secure your private data, right, along with your, you're starting with your financial data online. All right, who's next? Hi, I'm Caroline Dillard. I'm a, also a senior in accounting here at UTD. I'm set to graduate next May, and then I plan the fast track because UTD has a fast track master's program. So I'm going to do that afterwards and use it for the CPA exam. Um, the article I brought today is somewhat related to the article you brought up a couple weeks ago about soft pub that's on LinkedIn um, and sort of the fake profiles um, that you want to avoid making connections with. So this article was published on knowledge.ncia.edu. It's written by Pavel Korzynski, and it's called How Making New Friends on LinkedIn Can Boost Creativity. So essentially what it did is it's sort of a summary um, of a paper that the author of the article co-authored. Um, and basically it was a report of a study done on engineers, and they found a correlation between the creativity and personal innovativeness of those engineers and then number one, their willingness to play with new social media technologies. And two, their willingness to connect with um, new people that they hadn't previously known. Um, and what I found was interesting is that there's a correlation between making connections with um, you know, new people, people you haven't met before, um, either face-to-face or through a known connection. But that same correlation with creativity doesn't exist if you're just making connections with people that you've already met. Um, So essentially, uh, there's a correlation between creativity and then um, a diversified network of lead ties. Um, And basically, the the study put forth was that um, the reason for this is if you were making a connection with new people, you're getting access to new information and new data, and this um, builds your creativity. So I was kind of wondering, um, number one, your thoughts on it, and then number two, if there's a benefit of connecting with, um, you know, new acquaintances through social media, but there's also, you know, detrimental effects of connecting with um, soft topics or fake profiles, what are some things that we can look out for to avoid um, when making new connections? One proof of this is this podcast would not exist, right, if it wasn't for social media. Yeah. Chances are I would have never, I knew Blake through social media before I met Blake. Right. Or, or I knew of Blake, maybe is the better way to say that. And I, I look at other projects and things I've worked on over the last five, six, seven, eight, ten 10 years. And a lot of these connections have been because of social media. So it's totally valid. But equally, it's really annoying right now when I get 10 messages a day on LinkedIn, which I know are from bots or fake things or people trying to sell me stuff that are not engaging. And sometimes I feel like that sucks a little your soul away. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I, I, I don't know the best way to balance it. I don't know. If like if you came up with a great system or if any of you, it's because it gets very distracting. I, I can't even imagine being a student nowadays with the amount of social media and the distractions. Like, how do you study? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's crazy. Like I wasn't a student that long ago and I didn't have a smartphone. I met my wife in college, right? And uh, I never had to text her when we were dating. So I can't even imagine what you all go through having to like interpret a text message, you know, somebody that you're... <laughs> We had to talk on the phone, right? And it's amazing what's going on um, with social media. I would agree with David that our podcast wouldn't exist. We would not have met. Well, maybe we would have met at a conference, but we wouldn't have continued talking to each other if it wasn't for social media. A lot of the people that I know who are really forward thinking in the accounting profession, they'd be isolated otherwise. I mean, maybe you're one person in your firm who kind of is getting what's happening. And in the past, you would have been that one person and your ideas would have been crushed 
and you would have just gone along with uh, what everybody else was doing. But now you can connect with like-minded people in firms or in industry all over the country, and you can come together. And there are these groups that exist, and David and I are, are part of one together, people who work all over the place, all over the world, and we connect and we share ideas as to you know how we can better run our firms, build our applications, serve the community, advance the profession. You think about that, it applies to school, right? It's it the same model, right? You're, you're in classes, you're going to different classes every semester, you're constantly meeting new people, these collisions are happening, you're, you're, you're a creative peak there in college. Then you get out and you take a job with a company and you only talk to the same six people every day for the next five years if you stay there that long, right? And of course your creativity is going to get stifled. I think the key is like use social media intelligently. David, I want to know, do you still accept every LinkedIn invite that comes your way or have you changed <laughs> well, your behavior? Apparently, I'll be more creative if I connect with more people. So I just accept them all. <laughs> <laughs> so David and I are of different opinions. I I won't connect with somebody unless I, I can trust that they're real, that we have connection. You can't just look at connections in common though, because there's lots of bots that are really good at connecting with many, many people, uh, such as David, who don't, don't look at their profiles. <laughs> so... Uh, I try to be smart about it. I think the key is just connect with people who you know are real and that you want to continue conversations with. It's it's not like online is the future of everything. It's it's a it's a hybrid like many things, right? We take these on these meetings that we have at conferences, for instance, maybe a technology conference, and then we continue to talking and sharing ideas with those people throughout the year until the next time. Whereas in the past, it would have just been, I see this person once or twice a year. And I think it's important too. I like, uh, and I like this article that you brought because it mentions at the end, you know, employer policies about social media. Well, one day when you guys are running firms or running accounting teams or finance teams, I think it's really important to let your staff, especially if you have a firm, have their own identities on social media. It's a lot of firms, I think they kind of, they, they don't like it when the staff are out there on social media, they want the firm brand to be the only thing that's out there. But people don't buy from a brand, they buy from people when it comes to professional services. So you need to be out there building your own personal brand. And I don't mean this in like a sleazy marketing kind of way. I mean this in a, you are to most people, your social media profile, because you can only have so many one-to-one -one in-person relationships these days, but you can have many, many more via LinkedIn or Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or Snapchat or, you know, TikTok, I guess. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> right. And people want to connect with other people. They don't want to connect with companies or brands. Um, there's a good book that you guys should all read. It's called the Clue Train Manifesto. And even if you don't read the book, there's like just the 99 thesis. If you just read that, um, it takes you 20 minutes. And it's all about how markets are conversations. And those guys wrote that um, over a decade ago now, and it's so dead on. Uh, you know, this is, this is pre-Facebook. I think Twitter was just becoming a thing and social media was just becoming a thing, but they really got that things were changing, right? And intranets were changing um, internally and the internet was changing the way communications were happening. Um, and it's, it's not so much one way anymore. And so, yeah, being a face for your company is important because that's who people want to connect with, right? Other people, ultimately. And the tip I would leave you with is, um, you know, as you get out into the professional world and you start using LinkedIn, don't be afraid to post. Um, if you read something interesting, right, share that on LinkedIn and ask a question and interact with your colleagues and share ideas and information. It, it takes guts, I think. A lot of people, the vast majority of people never post on social media. They're just lurkers. I saw a study that on Facebook, something like 80 to 90% of people never post they only look at other people's posts and maybe 10% of people are out there commenting and creating content and that sort of thing. And I can tell you just based on my own experience that getting myself from that lurker point into that 10% has made all the difference in my career. So let's get into the next couple of stories because I feel like this is the, uh, the other side of the coin and pendulum here, Blake, of social media. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by BQE Core. If you have niche clients that are architects, engineers, consultants, or lawyers, BQE Core is the app for them to best manage their firm, increase their staff productivity, and ultimately increase their profits. Even if you don't have those niche clients, Core is a great tool to use in your own accounting or bookkeeping firm as well. Core is an easy-to-use all-in-one platform for project management, but includes advanced functionality like budgets, labor costs, forecasting, contract analysis, and approval processes. Core also includes a standalone accounting module. 
Even though Core is an all-in-one platform, it still works nicely with other apps, offering you and your clients the maximum amount of flexibility. Core offers a full-function mobile app and recently launched a cutting-edge voice-based assistant for your smart speaker of choice. To learn even more about BQE Core, head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash core. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash C-O-R-E. We got another story from Miguel. Kind of three related stories. So Miguel, same thing for you is your, your name, a little bit about yourself, and, uh, and then go ahead and share that story. So my name is Miguel Calderon, and I'm also a senior here at the University of Texas at Dallas, and I graduate this December, so a few more months. <laughs> um, but being that we are college students um, and our search for employment is a lot higher than probably the average person, um, I was looking at a couple of articles uh, for a survey done by careerbuilders.com that says roughly seven out of 10 employers search for candidates using social networking uh, sites for background checks. Uh, and about 43% of those employers continue using social media to check on current employees once the onboarding process is complete. So like everything, there's good and bad to this. Um, about 37% of the background information support supported the professional qualifications that the employee had in the resumes, and 23% of the candidates had great references from the job candidates, um, probably through one of these bots or something. Um, but the bad part uh, of all of this was that 27% of the people actually lied about their qualifications, uh, their qualifications in their resumes and 20% shared confidential information from their previous employers. Um, I know you mentioned uh, just on the last topic about using social media intelligently, um, but probably saying it on private uh, was my thought. Uh, but according to this article, about 47% of the employers said that they wouldn't call a person back if they couldn't find them on social media. Yeah. So what kind of balance would you uh, like could give like can give us uh, so we can have like a balance or something. Yeah, the, I love that you brought these stats. These are fantastic, and it, it really shows a difference between when I was a student and now. When I was a student, the advice was just don't be on social media, and if you just avoid it, anything public, then you can't damage your employment prospects. But now, if you're not on social media then the employers want to know, why aren't you on social media? And it can hurt you. So you're kind of caught, right? You have to be there. And if you really want to be safe, right? Just don't ever post anything anywhere that you wouldn't want the entire world to see. That's the safest thing to do. That's right? my policy too. I don't use any of those, like only show this post to 16 of my friends or only show this to a certain audience or this one's going to be a private post because all it takes is one misclick and you're, you're in trouble. So I just assume every time I post everything, it's wide open to the world. Everybody can see it. And it just keeps me safer that way, knowing I just choose not to put anything that should be private online. And I know that's that's hard, right? Because you want to be able to have that like close circle of friends uh, that you share with, but depending on your ambitions, right? Somebody might screenshot something and that might come back to bite you someday, right? Is it really worth it? So like, I, I agree with David uh, that you should really be the same person you are online that you are in person, that you are at work. I think there's a big shift happening in the world of work where it used to be that you had this like private person that you were at home and with your friends. And then you had this professional persona when you went to work. And those two things could exist separately and be completely different. And if you've watched the show Mad Men, you see that, right? Like most of the show, the drama is around people having these dual identities, right? Don Draper, perfect example, right? But now with social media, with everybody carrying a camera around in their pocket, you can't do that anymore. And we can see that there's actually some positive, uh, I think, effects of that. Like if you look at the whole Me Too movement, I don't think any of that would have happened if it wasn't actually for social media and people getting together online to talk about this kind of stuff. Like if you do something inappropriate, chances are somebody will pull out their camera and record you doing it. So you you can't you can't do that anymore. And we were just talking about privacy, right? This is one of the I think the good things about lack of privacy is that you can't hide. As, either <laughs> unless as a, you're Michael Mann with the my payroll HR fraud that we've been covering. That's right. That guy, yes. did, that guy hid pretty well. 
So the best thing to do is, yeah, every time you post, think, what, what, what if my parents saw this, right? What if my future employer saw this? Uh, and then don't do it if it's a question. But also, I don't think that means you have to be buttoned up because employers, they'll, they'll look at your profile and they'll figure out if it's not real. I think the key is to be yourself to the point where I'm not going to work at somebody's office if they're not okay with me being myself. And it's the only way we all get to a situation in which our jobs don't suck. I, I know that can be hard, right? Um, but it can work out. Like David has you know, made a whole career out of essentially being himself in a corporate environment. David, you want to talk about working it into it and your role and, you know, I mean, you, you stood out from the crowd there. I was maybe one of the first five or six employees at Intuit that were on Twitter and just started getting out there on social media. And it took a big company like Intuit years before they kind of got good at it or even knew what they wanted to do with it. Right. And in the meantime, you know, I kind of saw it as an opportunity because if you look at historically, if you guys probably have heard of Guy Kawasaki, he was the chief evangelist for, for Apple. Apple for years. And some of you guys play Xbox, Major Nelson who's on Xbox. So even though Xbox is a brand and Xbox is a platform, there's still these people or these faces of those platforms. And I kind of saw that as an opportunity of like, oh, we have this platform, QuickBooks Online. We have a platform for developers, right? The APIs, but we don't have a face, right? Pe people want to talk to a face. They want to think of a person when they think about that product. And so I just kind of went out there and started becoming that person. Not, not a little consciously, but not really. Um, the way it really, I just helped a lot of people and it just kind of snowballed and built from that. And, and David's being very modest, but he essentially was the face of the QuickBooks Online like ecosystem for many of us from the looking from the outside. At least that's how I perceived you, David. <laughs> so, I, I was good at smoking mirrors, huh? Well, you know, that's a big that's a big thing at a multi-billion dollar company. By the way, you guys, you know, if you don't know Intuit, maker of TurboTax and QuickBooks, right? The, one of the largest developers of accounting, cloud accounting software in the world. Yeah, so David did it. It may not be easy, but I think it it you were able to carve out a role for yourself because of it. At, at into it and has led to great yeah. things. So one thing just to build off of these two articles, these, these articles, like, yes, you as a student have to worry about to get hired, what you post on social media. But I heard something this week and I'm not sure what I was listening to. So I'm going to have to do some digging to get this link in the show notes. But the, uh, the, just the analogy would be this, right? You now have graduated. You work for accounting firm B, right? And it's a smaller firm. You guys have a Slack channel. Right. And you guys are communicating that. And maybe you're talking about all your competitors in there. Good, bad, immature talk, whatever it is, right? You, you in theory, it's a private channel, right? Now, accounting firm A gobbles you up. And now you're part of that accounting firm. Slack lets them take all those Slack messages and merge it into their instance of Slack. And so now every single person could just search all your old messages on Slack. So even the quote unquote private channels have some risk of not being private now. It's a really good point. Yeah, like we've kind of known this about email for a long time. When you send an email, that's like a postcard in a lot of ways. Like, would you put this on a postcard and send it in the mail? And somebody else could like read it at the office where you're sending it to. Same thing with Slack, with email. Um, we have to be really conscious of how we communicate. So how many of you post this on social media that you, you fear is going to not let you get a job? <laughs> I'll, I'll admit it, but that was back before anyone was warning anybody about that. <laughs> But let's, let's talk about some of the positive things, right, about posting on social media. Well, first of all, I wouldn't have gotten my last three jobs if I wasn't active on social media and posting and all that stuff. So that's a great thing, right, for me personally. In the last, the last three jobs I've interviewed for, I have not had to submit a resume because my LinkedIn profile and the stuff that I was posting on LinkedIn was plenty. They, didn't, they knew who I was. They knew what I could do. So that's a, that's a big bonus, right? Some of these other stats um, of reasons why employers hired a candidate because of what they saw on social media, that your background info supported your professional qualifications. It shows that you were creative, that you conveyed a professional image, that you showed a wide range of interests. I think that's important too, is don't think that because your employers are looking at social media, you can't post pictures of yourself kayaking or something because you like doing that. That's great, actually. People want well-rounded employees. Right? Especially if, if you're going into public accounting, they want people who are going to be developing business someday. Right? And if, if all you do is accounting, you're not going to be able to bring in business. You're not going to develop relationships right? And, and, and that sort of thing. So we could jump into some of the articles you and I brought, Blake. I have one that actually ties into exactly what you just said. Okay. Well, let's, let's okay. hear that. So this is an article that was in, um, on Accounting Web. 
why non-accountants are the growth engine for accounting firms. Oh, I saw that. So, you know, and obviously with all you being accounting majors, guess what? You didn't have to do that if you want to work for an accounting firm. Um, and, and, and arguably, <laughs> the, as, as they're getting away from a, a compliance work, right, and going to more technology-driven and advisory work, a different skill set's needed, right? And so what's good is it feels like Jennifer's preparing you guys for that, right? Uh, yeah. you know, beyond just compliance work. Um, and he goes into very specific uh, thoughts about this and how it actually even uh, helps with the culture and the diversity, et cetera. But it, it really drives back to what Blake was saying. They, they want diversity. They, they need different thoughts, especially in accounting firms. I think there's just uh, one marching orders and it, people, they need to stray from that more. Yeah. And I wouldn't like take that this trend is like a, a bad thing for accounting. It's it's really a good thing because accounting firms are diversifying. And a lot of the fast growing accounting firms actually don't describe themselves primarily as accounting firms. They describe themselves as either professional services firms or consulting firms that happen to be run by CPAs. And so there's a lot more opportunity inside of these firms that are growing to do a lot more than just you know audit and tax. Not that audit and tax are, are bad, we had a story last week, uh, this latest episode on the podcast about how tax manager is one of the best jobs in the country, right? High compensation and tons of opportunity for career growth. Well, I think of the top 15 jobs in America, right? Weren't four or five accounting related? Tax manager, audit manager, and accounting manager were all in the top 10 or 15, I can't remember. And it was a list that was ranked by career prospects. The idea being that it's not really so important what you're doing as how much opportunity you have to grow inside of that field. And so if you can get to the manager point quickly, if you can get past that staff level uh, and get to manager, then you've got a ton of options for career growth and it's a lot more fun. Let's see, what else should we talk about? I've got a story here. So how many of you subscribe to the, just a show of hands, like read the Journal of Accountancy? Is that something you guys are paying attention to? Yeah. Okay, cool. So like half. That's Those great. of you aren't. That's awesome. I'm not either. So it's okay. <laughs> well, so it is the most, you know, widely read publication uh, in accounting. So if you don't have a student subscription or membership, I suggest you, you know, and you want to be a CPA, um, you know, get one of those with the AICPA. They're not expensive and you get the journal as part of your membership. Uh, this article that I'm talking about now is the AICPA's Economic Outlook Survey. They do this every quarter and it's a survey of CPAs who are AICPA members in business and industry holding executive positions in both public and privately owned organizations of all sizes across a broad spectrum of industries. So CPAs in executive positions in business and industry. Um, and so they survey them every quarter. There's, there's kind of a slightly worrisome trend. CPA Outlook Index, this is the like a number between zero and 100 that this survey uses to give you an idea of you know, how positive CPAs are about the economy. It dropped from 75 to 72, but the index component for optimism about the U.S. economy dropped 10 points in the third quarter from 70 in the second quarter to now only 60, which is 19 points down from the third quarter of 2018. So if you've been following the news about you know, potential worsening of the trade war with China, about a possible recession coming, it seems that CPAs who are in these leadership positions in industry are also worried doesn't mean that necessarily it's going to hurt job prospects because accounting is one of those rare industries in which it continues to grow often in recessions. And actually, here's the bright spot in here is that for the last five quarters, the number one challenge facing organizations has been availability of skilled personnel. So if you are a skilled accountant, <laughs> you'll, be, you'll probably be just fine. Yeah, yeah. I brought in an article uh, for your economics class, I guess. Um, it's uh, written by actually another professor, uh, Sean Stein Smith. So he's been on the podcast before, really f heavily focused on uh, Bitcoin and blockchain. Um, everybody's familiar with WeWork, right? WeWork, the co-working platform. Nod your heads. Okay. Yes. It, it's no. like the library. <laughs> you go there to, to work, right? Except for they have a kegs and coffee. It's, but it's kind of, it's, and you go into work. And they have and internet, internet. Oh, high speed internet. Well, I guess they have that at the library too. too. So, anyway, so WeWorks had this dramatic um, rise and fall, 
to where they were about to IPO. They, I think, had a crazy valuation. They wanted to IPO at $43 billion. And, and now they've completely pulled back. They're not going to IPO. And um, Sean's article basically points out that everything about the failed WeWork IPO proves that free markets work and that we should be celebrating it. And the quote I really love in here is to, uh, that he wrote was, to succeed, any company must create more resources than it consumes. And WeWork simply has not met that requirement. And I thought that was just a perfect way to, to phrase it. Markets work and accounting, it wouldn't be possible without accounting, right? This is, this is one of those things that we don't talk about a lot, but like the entire capitalist free market system relies on financial statements and they worked in this case, right? People realize that you cannot run a real estate company with operating expenses, twice your revenue and go public and, and expect people to invest money at this insane valuation. So I, I check, check out their uh, S, I think it's their S1 filing. I can't remember the no name of the form, but check out WeWork's filing. It's Take that crazy. article to your economics is, class and try to get some extra credit. So I th David, I think we should uh, pivot yeah. now to the Q&A section. We got a special segment here. Uh, if you want to ask us any questions, you're welcome to do so at this time. Okay, so we've got a handful of students who've got some questions in the classroom, and I'll just pass the mic around to those guys and let you all answer them. And, and we know that you prepared questions, but if you want to, if something has come up, uh, you know, based on this discussion or just is at top of mind, feel free to ask whatever you want. Yes, hello. So my name is Ola Slavi. I'm a senior here at UT Dallas, uh, graduating in, the, in May. So my question is, uh, from the perspective of someone who is aware of the global trends in cloud accounting, what can a fleshly professional do to put themselves ahead of the curve? So the question is, from the perspective of someone who is aware of global trends in cloud accounting, what can a fledgling professional do to put themselves ahead of the curve? I could tell you that based on my study of technology trends, that everything is headed toward more and more and more automation. That was true in, in my career, starting as a bookkeeper. 10 years ago, 80% of my job was doing data entry. I was doing bookkeeping to put myself through school to get my CPA. And within five years, that had inverted. And maybe 20% of the job of bookkeeping today is data entry. And the rest can be you know, whatever value-added services you want to provide on top of that. Maybe that's doing cloud-based bill pay or payroll or you know, analyzing financial statements even, uh, if you've got those skills. So that happened in the small business world. You know, David, as the ecosystem guy for QuickBooks Online, you know, you saw that automation happening. I mean, I saw it even before that. If I go back to early in my career, I got into quality assurance, testing QuickBooks before we'd ship it. And in those days, you'd have to test it and make sure everything was perfect because you were making a CD that you'd physically have to send and ship. And so if you shipped a bug, it's very hard to send a new CD. It costs millions of dollars to do that. But now with cloud accounting, if there's a bug, they just fix it and somebody refreshes their browser, they have the fix. But what I saw that in those days is things started moving from manual automated testing where you were clicking everything and clicking every button, uh, typing every field, deleting every field, and you'd start using tools to automate that, right? So I, I've been on this automation trend for, yeah, probably 15 years now I've seen it um, across the board. So the accountants who learn to master automation tools and technology are going to have unlimited opportunities. So that is my recommendation to you. And you may ask me, well, how do I do that? How do I actually get experience? Because when I go work for a firm, chances are they're not going to let me touch that stuff right away. Or maybe I start an audit or maybe I'm in tax. I would say, do this on your own time on the side is go find a small business that will let you do their bookkeeping and play around with the technology and build a QuickBooks Online general ledger that's hooked up to some sort of cloud-based bill pay system and try doing integrations, play around with these different apps. You know, maybe do an internship in an outsourced accounting department in an accounting firm. Uh, I mean, that's how I got all my experience doing this. Is You can't learn it in school because it's developing too quickly. I mean, you can learn the general principles of integrating information systems, but to really know it, you've got to do it. And even if that's not your dream, say working with QuickBooks or with Xero, and you want to work in larger enterprises, right? You want to go work for Coca-Cola or something like that. Well, all the principles of integrating systems and data flow and automation, they all apply. It's the same stuff. It's just more complex. So if you're working with QuickBooks or you're working with NetSuite or you're working with SAP or Oracle, fundamentally, these are the same principles. And you can learn a lot doing it 
on the small business side to train yourself for that enterprise level work. And I would say the same thing about robotic process automation technology. Companies like UiPath that build this incredible automation technology that you know you may not be able to get access to right now, but you could learn how to do basic automation with macros. I mean, I think you could even just start on your own personal level with small tools like calendar tools uh, to, for scheduling. It sounds dumb, but, oh, we're going to go out for drinks tonight. Or what's the best time we can all go out to drinks tonight? So there's tools. You can start incorporating these into your uh, life now. Um, there's also tools that will compose to social media. And so you could have it automatically. Oh, yeah. I'm just throwing this out there. Automatically read the show notes huh. in the Cloud Accounting Podcast, right? And then grab all those articles and tweet them out from your account. And then a job, an employer would be like, wow, this person really finds great articles and tweets these out. But there's all these tools. And just by using those, you're just going to start building fundamentals on how to connect different apps together and move data around and sending data to where you want it to go. Even though it's, not, it's nothing accounting related, but if you just get those as a basic skill level, yeah, you'll it's just going to put your head on that path. All right. Next question. Hello. My name is Heather Hoagland. And... I very much appreciate you uh, mentioning how important that is, like, because I currently work at a small company and I'm doing a bookkeeping, so I'm glad that that's, you know, given me experience and taking me somewhere. But my question for both uh, you and David is, what would you say to someone who dreams um, of starting their own accounting business? I would say it's never been easier. That's the beauty of it, right? So I was kind of in your situation where I was, you know, doing bookkeeping. I was getting to apply the skills that I was learning or the theory that I was learning in reality. I got to apply the theory in this business. So here I am making journal entries, making mistakes. Luckily with accounting, you can always undo your mistakes, right? You you can delete that journal entry or you can uh, uh, post a reversing one. I would say um, you could literally these days probably graduate from school. And if you have enough work experience, you could start doing some basic work, bookkeeping, some tax. Like, like you don't even have to go into, if you're good at selling and marketing, you don't even have to go to a firm and get experience these days. That's insane. That never used to be the case. In this day and age, it's cheaper than ever, right? You you need a laptop and a Starbucks with internet. If you're just going to do cloud accounting for others, like you can create an accounting yeah. firm for almost nothing, um, relatively cheap. You're, you're talking a few thousand dollars, yeah. right? Of investment. Um, but about what I would say is that if you want to own your own small firm, David always talks about specialization and niching, right? And becoming an expert in a particular industry because that's where everything's headed. Accounting firms used to do everything for everybody and you can you can see it changing, right? Now there's a CPA firm just for breweries, right? There's multiple actually, there's many. Uh, there's people who focus just on working with dentists because their needs are specific and uh, it could go on and on. I worked with a lot of um, entertainment people here in LA. Getting experience in that industry is going to really strengthen you for owning your own firm someday. So, and, and I've seen that some of my colleagues uh, worked as controllers before owning their own firms. So instead of going the whole public accounting route, they got out of that as quickly as they could. They got into industry, and then they learned their craft there. And then you can be a really great management accountant working in public. Hi, thank you. My name is uh, Colton Irving. I'm a senior accounting student as well. My question is. I'm curious about the growth of the field of advisory and if y'all think that that particular field is going to see a lot more regulation in the coming years, or if not, uh, do you see there could be issues from lack of oversight of these consultants? Interesting. So the question is then, is advisory going to see more regulation? As far as like, like, hey, you have to pass some sort of certification or testing in order to provide advisory work. Because right now, anyone can be an advisor, right? You don't have to be a CPA to do it. It's a good question. I mean, I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon because I think the AICPA has enough on its hands just trying to deal with the changing CPA exam and requirements for education. And I mean, they've got a whole initiative called CPA Evolution about how do we change the curriculum, the exam to you know modernize accounting. So extending the accounting you know franchise into advisory, unlikely, or the CPA franchise into advisory is, is unlikely. And, and it's interesting because I think Texas has an uh, interesting regulation, right? On you can't say that you're an accountant or a bookkeeping firm unless you're truly a CPA. Is that correct? You can't call your, you can't use the word accounting in your company's name unless you're a CPA firm. I think that's true in Texas. Would you guys know this? Yeah, that's correct. Um, 
You can't technically call yourself an accountant if you put your services out to the public if you are not a CPA. And then they, they do find people and uh, ask them to cease and desist. So that's interesting because here in California, that's not the case. And that's why I was able to start my accounting, quote unquote, accounting services firm as a student before I was a CPA. Uh, and, and anybody can call themselves an accountant, even if they don't have a degree here. So it's kind of a total like free wheeling situation in California. And I actually am not, I'm not a huge fan of regulation in general. Uh, I think a lot of accountants and CPAs tend to be a little more conservative when it comes to that, because we see our business owner clients suffering from uh, overly burdensome regulation, especially here in California. But in that one case, I think it's like kind of confusing to the public that we have certified public accountants, but then anyone can call themselves an accountant. Texas is is actually, it's funny, it's kind of flipped. Normally, California is overly regulated, but in this case, Texas has more regulation and I think is doing the right thing. Great. I think we have one more question unless somebody else has got one. Hey, how are you doing? Uh, my name is uh, Vicente Ruiz. Uh, my question is, do you think professional accountants will do, be doing the same thing they do today in five years or in 10 years? Uh, so this is interesting because it ties into this discussion that we have had over the last few months this summer about the move to advisory from compliance. There's a lot of people out there saying, oh, compliance is getting automated. You got to do something else. And by compliance, I mean traditional service areas like tax and audit. And my view is that that's not going away. It's just a lot of the administrative and rote work in those fields is going away which is actually great because that's why like being a tax manager and audit manager is going to be a great job because there's a lot less crap you got to deal with a lot less you know boxes to fill in and all that stuff what do, what do you think david i think the answer is more of what kind of professional accountant are you i guarantee you there will be professional accountants still doing stuff 10 years from now the same the way they the same exact way they did it 20 years ago yeah and so i, I think it depends on who the professional accountant is and that's going to define that and you know we see that in surveys of growth rates of firms, seventy five percent of firms are growing at about five to six percent per year, which is standard for the industry, and that's considered good, right? If you're a traditional accounting firm, if you grow five six percent, you're happy. The firms that are leading the way are growing twenty to thirty percent, which is insane rates of growth for a professional services firm, and that's what I saw when I had my own firm because they were doing things differently. And so, yeah, it depends, I guess, if you're part of one of those high growth firms. Or if you're part of a traditional firm, maybe in the past, I would have been more critical of that traditional firm. But honestly, like if that makes you happy, if that's what you want to do, that's great. And it's going to be a good business for a long time, like David said. But if you want to do something completely different, there's a lot of opportunity now to rewrite the rules. Hopefully you all want to be accountants still. <laughs> We're not ruining this. Yeah, yeah. So actually, can, can we see a, a, a raise of hands? So who in the class is intending at this time on going into accounting. Okay, good. Yeah. So most folks, so we haven't, I, you know, we, we should have taken a poll at the beginning and then at the end to really know if we made a difference, <laughs> but <laughs> we're not statisticians. I think the difference really is that they get to see all the different opportunities now. Um, and you're not just boxed into having to do tax or audit or just basic accounting. I, I think that accounting is the biggest secret in school right now. Like, because it has this image that has over the last, you know, hundred years, we've had this image of being this boring, stodgy profession. And now you can, you can pretty much do anything and you can make a lot of money and you can have a lot of fun. And I always tell people, you know, I used to be a musician before I got into bookkeeping and then into accounting, got my CPA. I think that what I get to do as a CPA in technology is way more interesting than when I was a musician. People don't believe that, but it's it's true. Um, it's changing so rapidly. And, and if you're a lifelong learner, if you love learning uh, new things and trying new things, um, there's there's plenty of opportunity for that. I guess we should, that with that, we can, we can wrap it, right? Do we get to say class dismissed or uh, anything like that? <laughs> <laughs> yes, dismiss the class. So uh, as always, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at Blake T. Oliver. You can also connect with me on LinkedIn. I would love everyone in the room today, please feel free to reach out and connect. Um, if you do, though, just write me a note so that I know you're not a bot. 
<laughs> and you, how about you, David? I'm really easy to track down on Twitter uh, at David Leary. I'm also on LinkedIn at David Leary. And you can find the Cloud Accounting Podcast on all the socials. Uh, we probably need to get on Instagram. I imagine many of you are, in, are Instagrammers and we're not there yet. So we probably... We should get on that here. <laughs> yeah, it would, but it would be the same picture every week of just us talking. So <laughs> we'll have to figure just, that one out. I'd Maybe pick out we, random fashionable clothes out of the closet and post those to the Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> so, so thank you all. And, uh, and thanks for, for joining us. And uh, best wishes to all of you in your careers. Class dismissed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.